howdy radiant, and we want to say hello to our extended family and those of us are, who are joining from your homes all over the place. Uh, just something that I just thought was really cool is uh, today when I came into the office and got ready to prepare for service, uh, I had a card, and in the card it was, a, it was written by a family in Fort Wayne, Indiana, that said that in March when COVID kind of kicked in, uh, they were recommended to watch a message, and so they watched this message and started tracking with Radiant, and they have been watching and a part of our prayer meetings and our services, even with their teenagers, since that time, and now they're about to start a watch party in their home in Fort Wayne, Indiana. So we just praise God for what he's doing. And so we want to say hello to those in Fort Wayne, and we want to say to those in Portage and kind of all over the place, Radiant Tribe. Uh, Welcome, and uh, welcome to Thanksgiving weekend 2020. And uh, we just want to tell everybody that we love you, and there's so much to be thankful for. I know that this year has been a exercise in flexibility, but uh, if we really step back, I know that this Thanksgiving for a lot of people is going to look a lot different for a lot of us. But uh, I just want to encourage us to really take some time, even this week, and really stop and reflect and intentionally give thanks to the Lord for the good things and for his goodness, because God is really good all the time, and he's worthy to be praised. And so we're praying for you. We're praying for your families. We're giving thanks for all of you, and uh, we're praying that even though things may look different, uh, might not as have, have as many family members with you this year, I'm praying for a uh, Thanksgiving Day miracle that the Detroit Lions will win, actually, on a Thanksgiving Day. So... Anyways, hey, if you would, open your Bibles with me, or turn them on and look at Acts chapter 11. I want to bring a message to you this weekend called The Divine Reset. The Divine Reset. In Acts chapter 11, looking at verse number 19 through verse 26, says, Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen, traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus in Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists, that's Greeks, also preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And when he came and he saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. And he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. And so Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch for a whole year, and they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. This particular chapter in the book of Acts, Acts is really the the, the narrative of how the church began. It covers probably 20 to 30 years time frame from Acts chapter 1 all the way to Acts chapter 28. And, you know, we focus so often about how the church began in Acts chapter 2 with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, Pentecost, and Peter standing up and preaching one of the most powerful evangelistic messages, even to this day, 3,000 people were added to the church and baptized. And so that's our birth date as the church. It's also our celebration point of seeing what God wanted to do through this entity that he established called the church. But by the time we get to Acts chapter 11, we see the church not gathered, but we see the church now scattered. The church was scattered because of persecution. You see, the church was becoming very, very powerful, very effective at proclaiming and preaching the gospel. Stephen was this young man who comes on the scene. He's a deacon in the church, which means he's serving. He's not literally, he's not one of the apostles. He's just an evangelist. But he's preaching with such conviction and with such power that many, many people are getting saved and miracles are taking place. And so the Jewish leaders 
are so threatened at what is taking place that they stone Stephen. They actually kill him, murder him, martyr him for preaching the gospel. And what we see happens right from there, Acts chapter 8 verse 4 says, now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. So the church gathered together mostly in Jerusalem, primarily Jewish believers in Messiah who now have recognized that Jesus is Messiah. They're gathering together, they're worshiping, there's this awe and wonder, there's prayers, there's teaching, there's all of these things that happen in the gathered church. But as soon as persecution breaks out, first because of Stephen's martyrdom, and now, as we just read about, there's a persecution that begins to take place. Greater pressure is being applied to the church. Something happens when the church goes from being the church that is gathered to the church that is now scattered. They begin to go out into cities, communities, regions, and even different nations that they had not previously brought the gospel to. Now, how many of you remember what Jesus said to the disciples in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, just before his ascension into heaven? He said, you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You guys remember that? You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be, what? Witnesses, starting in Jerusalem, Judea, that's the region, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. Now, when the Holy Spirit was poured out, Peter stands up and he preaches a sermon, that's Jerusalem. The church was growing in Judea, but they hadn't yet brought the gospel to Samaria, and they really weren't interested in going into the uttermost parts of the world, because you know who was in the uttermost parts of the world? The unclean Gentiles, the Greeks, the dogs, the untouchables. And so even though Jesus had commanded them to go and to reach the lost everywhere, throughout the whole world, preach the gospel to all creation. That's what it says in Mark 16, Matthew 24, go into all nations, make disciples of all nations. That word nations is ethnic group, ethnos, ethnic groups, not just Jewish, but go into the Gentile nations and make disciples of them. Even though Jesus had told the apostles to do this, they had not done it. And it took pressure of persecution to actually push them out into those regions. And even when they did that, it says that they preached primarily unto the Jewish people until until you look at verse number 20, it says that there were some of them. Men of Cyprus and Cyrene, Cyrene's northern Africa, Cyprus is an island. It says, on coming to Antioch, Antioch is in Syria. When they came to Antioch, they spoke to the Greeks. They spoke and they preached Jesus. They witnessed, they shared their faith, they preached about Jesus to the Greeks, which was very difficult. It was, I mean, I don't even think we understand the grid that it took for them to do this for a couple of reasons, because when you and I share our faith or we preach sermons, we do it in a cultural context where the gospel has penetrated almost every aspect of, at least in our context, American culture. Now, that doesn't mean everybody knows the gospel, but everybody kind of has a grid or at least a perception of the church. When the Jewish believers in Jesus were preaching in Israel only, they had people that they were preaching to who had an understanding of the Old Testament. The Old Testament was their sacred scriptures, their library of scriptures. So when Peter stands up and he preaches, he quotes the Old Testament because they have that same grid of understanding. When you go to Antioch and you preach to Greeks, they don't know what you're talking about. They're just like, what are you talking about? Are you talking about Apollo? Or are you talking about Zeus? Or are you talk- No, we're not talking about those gods. We're not talking about your pantheons of gods. We're talking about the creator of heaven and earth. No statues, no visible expression. We're talking about the God that is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Jewish God. And they're just like, oh yeah, we're fine with you worshiping that. And they had to say to them, no, we're saying that the things that you've worshiped aren't really gods at all. And we're here to declare to you the one true God. Oh yeah, tell us about it. Well, 
He revealed himself to Abraham and ultimately came as a man, Jesus of Nazareth, who lived a sinless, perfect life, and then went to the cross and was crucified for the sins of the whole world. Why would he do that? That sounds counterproductive. Oh, but on the third day, God raised him back to life again, and he is now Lord of all. And all who believe in that will have their sins forgiven. You know, the whole gospel, we don't have a clue at how foreign that message was. And how much for these men from Cyrene and Cyprus, how they had to adapt what they knew as the truth they had to adapt it in a way to present it to people who had no Old Testament. They had no grid. But yet, here's what happened. Because the pressure of persecution was applied to the church, and it pushed them out to go and to live in new communities, new cities, they were running, they're hiding, they're visiting family, they're, they're moving all throughout the Roman Empire. They're following the roads in Antioch, Syria, Rome, Spain, France. They're going into northern Africa. They're going over into what's modern-day Iraq. They're all over the place. When they go, something began to happen. It didn't happen fast, it wasn't explosive, there wasn't a plan, but it happened with just a few. A few began to look around their new surroundings and realize these are the people that Jesus not only died for, but he told us to go and to preach to them. And they began to preach and the gospel began to penetrate new frontiers in new ways. And many people began to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ that were not Jewish. So now we've got Gentiles coming into the church. Most of us who are listening to this message do not have much, if any, Jewishness in us. I did that Ancestry.com and it came back, surprisingly, 3% Ashkenazi Jew. So I'm part of the tribe. I never even knew it, but I got a little bit in there. I got a whole lot of Irish, English, and Scotch, and a little bit of Jewish. I'm claiming every ounce of that. But most of us who are listening to this today, we're, we're Gentiles. And we owe our salvation to this moment, this crisis that pushed the gospel out into the nations of the world. Let me put it to you this way. What the enemy meant to destroy the church in Acts 11, what the enemy meant to destroy the church, God used to deploy the church. I want that to set in. What the enemy meant to destroy the church, God used to deploy the church. And the gospel began to penetrate. It started with a trickle, but it began to penetrate new frontiers. One of the things that we're passionate about as a church and as a, as a, a group of people, Radiant, is we're passionate about the gospel penetrating into the nations of the world. We don't just support missions, agencies, and organizations, and mercy ministries just because it's the philanthropist thing to do that we've done so well that it's just right for us to give back. I think that that's valid and there's a place for that in communities and cultures, but that's not why we as a church do it. That's not why we do the big give every year because we need to have some big mega giveaway that just is like, oh, makes us feel good about what we do. Let me tell you about, let me tell you about why we do the, the big give and why we support missionaries and the, the gospel being preached in some of the most difficult places on the earth. It's why we raise hundreds of thousands of dollars every year. It's why we send missionaries and why we visit and all, all of the things that we do and the prayers that we pray over it is because we believe that the great commission that Jesus gave the church in Matthew 28 in Acts chapter one is still, it's not just the great commission, it's the only commission that Jesus gave us to make disciples. It's because Jesus paid such a high price for our salvation. It's not right for us to keep it to ourselves. And the big give is an opportunity every year that, especially in a commercialized culture of Christmas and holidays and gift giving, 
It's an opportunity for us to be countercultural and say, we're not going to take this season and lavish it just on us. We're actually going to invest into some partnerships that are going to penetrate into deeper frontiers with the gospel because we've partnered with them. If you have not picked up one of our Big Give catalogs, uh, they're available out in the lobbies, and if you're online, you can get them online. It lists off all of our missionaries. It lists off where they are. It lists off the endeavors that they have. It, we, we list the local partners and the mercy ministries that we're a part of. And this year, the reason why we want to do what we're calling the stimulus is because it, this is a year, much like Acts chapter 11, where there's been a crisis and that crisis has been felt not only here, but it's been felt around the world. But anytime there's a crisis, there is always an open door. And we believe it's our responsibility. I, I think fear would cause us to draw back. Faith says, oh, there's a crisis? Let's step through that door. Let's grab a hold of these opportunities. Because when the church does that, we begin to see, just like we read here at Acts 11, that some step into it, lean into it, and, and it actually leads to there being a multiplication. It actually leads to a, a divine opportunity and a divine open door for many, many more people to come to faith. So we want to be the church deployed. Even in the midst of the things that we're going through, the crisis that the church is you know, facing is not any different than the crisis that the church faced in Acts chapter 11, or in Acts chapter 8, we're facing the same stuff. But here's what it does do. It does cause us, just like it caused the church in Acts chapter 11, to reconsider our modus operandi. You see, when you have, uh, uh, in secular terms and business terms, here's what they say. Crisis is the great accelerator. Whenever you face a crisis, it is the great accelerator. It can be an accelerator of fear. It can be an accelerator of faith. It can be an accelerator of change. It can be an accelerator of destruction. But crisis is the great accelerator. And in 2020, I believe the church is in the midst of what I'm calling a divine reset. Much like Acts chapter 11. It's a divine reset. I've had so many people over the last several months ask, ask me the question, what do you think's going on? What is this? What is this? Is, is, is this the end times? Well, let me say this. I do believe we're living in the end times. But even in the midst of that, I believe that what the enemy may have meant to injure people, to set some things in motion, Bible prophecy-wise, that in our culture, not just the COVID virus, but I mean, so many different things that have been crises piled one on top of another in this year. I believe that that pressure, if we have ears to hear and eyes to see it, can become a divine reset where God reorganizes our priorities, our mode of operation, our way of seeing things that can ultimately lead to a massive shift in the way we engage with the culture of the kingdom, just like the world right now is looking at the potential of a great reset that reorganizes the globe. I don't know if you've heard that phrase recently, the, the great reset, but if they'll put this picture up here, Time Magazine just put this out uh, earlier this month, the great reset. And you might see how the world is under construction. That's not just a, a metaphor. Literally, there is a plan and a strategy that is being implemented called the Great Reset. It's ultimately, it was uh, based on a book called COVID-19, The Great Reset, written by a man named Klaus Schwab, who is the director of the World Economic Forum. He wrote a book. And basically, I have the book in my office. And basically, in the book, he said, you never waste a crisis. And so this is a perfect opportunity for us to radically reset the social order globally. Reset ecology, reset economies, reset technology, national borders. I mean, so, I mean, pretty massive stuff. Basically, talking about global digital currency, talking about a one-world government, 
talking about uh, healthcare passports, uh, contact tracing, things that have now become somewhat normalized globally, talking about doing that on a grand scale that resets the whole global community and shrinks it down into a micro neighborhood. Now, lest you think that it's just some wacko, crazy guy off in a corner who wrote a paperback, he has the backing of the Prime Minister of Canada. He has the backing of Prince Charles. He has the backing of several G7 nations, the World Bank, several different things who are signing off on that. We're, we're literally seeing some of the things that I believe are connected to Bible prophecy taking place in our day. Listen to this quote from uh, Klaus Schwab. He said, This is the fourth industrial revolution, and it will lead to a fusion of our physical, digital, and biological identities. Well, if that doesn't wake you up tonight. This is what the world is looking at and seeing. Look, everything is shaking, and in the midst of instability, here's what we ought to do. In the midst of instability, let's go back and let's rebuild the world the way that we want to build it. I would propose to you that the world, several thousand years later, is still trying to finish the product that they started in Genesis when they said, come and let us build a city and a tower that goes into heaven and make a name for ourselves. And that city's name was Babel. And God came down, and do you remember how he deconstructed it? He came down and confused their languages. There's now an app for your smartphone that can help you translate whatever you want to say into whatever language you want to. Do you know what that app is called? Babel. Please don't download it. Uh, um. Unless you're traveling internationally and absolutely need to find where the bathrooms are. I get that. But this is what is taking place. It's humanistic. It's mankind. Seeing a crisis, knowing that crisis is the great accelerator for change and trying to seize the moment to rebuild the world, it's a divine reset. It's a great reset. But in the midst of it, I say that not to cause us to to step back and to become fearful, but literally understand this, that the enemy, spiritually speaking, does nothing without it being a response to what he knows God is doing. See, because ultimately you and I are people of the kingdom of God, and we know that there is coming the ultimate reset one day when Jesus Christ, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, returns to this earth, and he makes the earth and his enemies his footstool, sets up, sits on the throne from Jerusalem, and reigns and rules the nations of the earth for a thousand years and on into eternity, and ushers in a period of time that is peaceful, and the curse is reversed. That is the ultimate reset. But in the meantime, in the meantime, I believe that in the midst of a a period of time where the world is looking at reset, because I think even subconsciously the world's looking at and going, things are changing, things are shifting, how do we respond to that? And if you don't have the Lord, you don't know how to respond. But listen, we are the church, and we know the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, which is your kingdom and your will be. And part of how we see that come to pass is we need to have a resetting of our hearts. See, you and I, the the divine reset that I think God wants to bring in the church in this hour, I want you to imagine with me what it could look like in our future if the church on an individual level that then panned out into a macro corporate expression We just had a massive recalibration of our hearts towards the things of God and the kingdom of God. Could it be, and is it possible, that the church, the only thing holding the church back from fulfilling our mission, which is to go into all the world and preach the gospel, Like Jesus said in Matthew 24, when he said, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to all nations as a witness, and then the end will come. Could it be that the only thing stopping us from fulfilling that commandment is actually us? 
I believe that that is the case. I believe we have all of the people. I believe we have all of the money. I believe we have all of the technology. We have the travel. We have the strategies. We've got the education. We've got the boards and the committees. We've got it all. The only thing that we haven't yet done really is on an individual level. All of us in the middle of this crisis have a moment much like Acts chapter 11 where we've not been going to the nations and we've not brought the gospel to certain groups of people because we're uncomfortable with it, and we've been very comfortable in our little bubble, but now in the midst of a crisis and things are beginning to shake and we see prophecy on the horizon, could it be that there's something that happens in the church that resets us to where we say, oh, this is who we are. This is what we are called to. We're not just called to be the church gathered, we're called to be the church that gathers to scatter. And now here we are, we find ourselves scattered in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and Iowa, and we find ourselves all over the planet, and we've had to be fluid and flexible, and oh, we have been so flexible. And we do this, and we do that, and we do this, and all of a sudden we're beginning to realize, look, this isn't just about us having church, it's about us being the church. It's about us saying, Jesus, we've become too comfortable, too familiar, too enthralled. We've allowed too many things to compete. We've become too indifferent towards the gospel. And in the middle of all this, Jesus, would you reset my heart? Because if you reset my heart and you reset all of our hearts, another word for that is revival. Whenever we use that word revival, people think of an organ on sawdust floors in a tent and some frothing mouth evangelist who comes in and preaches for three or four nights and everybody gets saved all over and you're good till next year. That's not revival. Revival is when the people of God are once again captured by the presence of God and we are undone by God and we re-sign up for the commitment of God. We get engaged in the mission of God once again. God literally puts the defibrillator paddles on the chest of a sleeping church and whoop. Just imagine that just whoop, all of a sudden, whoa. We jolt back to life and go, ah, oh, what are we supposed to be doing? Let's go. Let's go. Not, oh, I'm really tired. This is hard. 2020. I just want 2021 to be a nap. Just one big nap. Lord, I need a nap. Anybody else tired? What's the solution to the weariness? Boom. Holy Spirit infusion of vision and perspective. That is going to change it all. And if there's ever been a time to reset our hearts, church, it's right now. It's right now. When I was uh, a young boy, my mom had a friend. We were living in Pontiac at that time, and my mom's friend's, my mom's, friend's mom had a house, and we stopped by there one day. It was in July, and it was a windy day. It was near the 4th of July. My mom had just bought me some sparklers. And so we stopped by the house to say hi to Mrs. Boyd, and uh, we're talking with her. She had a walkout basement, and the bottom level of her basement was a ceramic studio where she made ceramics and sold them at fairs. And so because she packed them as ceramics, she had all kinds of newspaper in the basement. And so my mom wanted to talk to Mrs. Boyd. We're standing outside. The wind's blowing. I'm like five years old. I'm like, Mom, light my sparkler. She's trying to talk. She goes to light. It won't light. So she steps into the basement and hands me the sparkler, and she lights the sparkler, and I wave it around, then walked outside. And she's talking. And then I looked back through the door, and I saw what I thought was a barbecue grill. But what it was was her basement was on fire <laughs> because the sparkler had lit the shredded newspaper on fire. And I'll never forget, Mrs. Boyd went crazy. She's like, my house is burning down. And the police or the police showed up, the fire department showed up. I burned her entire house down. You did not know that about your pastor, did you? <laughs> burned it down to the ground. To the ground. 
bow your heads right now. Just. <laughs> but we, we went back and saw Mrs. Boyd a year later, and my mom felt so bad. She was so ashamed of her son. And so when we went back a year later, I remember just my mom saying, Mrs. Boyd, I'm so sorry. And Mrs. Boyd was like, are you kidding me? That was the best thing that ever happened because I got to rebuild my house the way I wanted it. I got everything all brand new. She goes, this is the best thing. I should have had you burn this down years ago. <laughs> what would happen if, what would happen if we burned down our per perceptions of who we are and what we are called to? And we let this present crisis actually become a, recalibration of our hearts and change everything. Listen to this, this scripture in Hosea chapter 10. It says in verse number 12, sow for yourselves righteousness, reap steadfast love, break up the fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord, that he may come and rain righteousness upon you. Translation, revival. You have plowed iniquity and you have reaped injustice. You have eaten the fruit of lies. Oh, how many, how many apples of lies, how many oranges, and how, how much produce that is formed of, out of the root system of this world that is based in deception have we been eating? The fruit of lies, because you, here's the key, because you have trusted in your own way. What does Hosea say to do? It's time to seek the Lord. It's time for a reset, a recalibration, and what does he say is the solution? Plow up the fallow ground of your hearts. Now I want you to turn to one more passage with me today, Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, Jesus teaches this parable of the sower, and in verse number 18, it says, hear the parable of the sower. Jesus is giving the translation of it. It says, and when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches it away, what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. Verse 20, as for the one that was sown on the rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a little while. And then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word. But the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfaithful. As for the one that was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word, understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case, a hundredfold, in another 60, and in another 30. Jesus uses a parable about soil to paint a picture of how we captivate, how we cultivate our hearts. The soil is the different conditions of our hearts. What's Jesus talking about? Jesus is talking about the reality that each of us are responsible for the condition of the soil of our heart. And we all respond to the same word. It's the same word. The sower goes and sows the seed. It's the same word. It's the same seed, but whether the seed releases the fullness of its potential is not determined upon the seed or the sower. It's dependent upon the soil. So you can have the same seed, the same word, but it doesn't produce fruit in the life of one kind of soil, one heart condition, but if it finds the right soil, it can produce 30, 60, and 100-fold multiplication. What kind of soil did it find in Acts chapter 11? It found good soil in some that then multiplied disciples into the kingdom of God, 30, 60, and 100 fold. But there were others that it was like seed that fell by the wayside and the birds of the air came and snatched it up. Here's the question. What kind of soil is our heart? And what does it mean to do what Hosea said to plow up the fallow ground? Because it's time to seek the Lord. Here's what he's saying. It's time for a divine reset for all of us. It's time for us to stop, to measure, to evaluate the condition of the soil of our heart in this moment. 
Because what God wants to do is he wants to put the plow in, turn it over, and prepare us for what he has in store. See, if we have a prophetic imagination today, instead of seeing where we're stuck right now because we can't go where we want to do, go and we can't do what we want to do, we would have our eyes spiritually on the horizon and say, what's coming on the other side of this? I'm not talking about political systems, geopolitical issues. I'm talking about kingdom of God issues. If the enemy comes in like a flood, how many know he has come in like a flood? What does it mean for God to raise up a standard against him? What does it mean for Joel 2 to be a reality where he pours out his spirit without measure on all flesh? Are we ready for that? It's time to seek the Lord. Four things, and probably needed to make this a whole nother message, but do you guys got another hour? Okay, good. You've got no place to go, I know, but... <laughs> Jesus said, some seed fell along the path and the birds came and devoured it. What is this speaking of? It means we gotta reset our priorities. We've gotta get rid of indifference, apathy, and familiarity with the gospel. When that happens, our heart gets hard. It's like a path that you've walked over. Many, oh, I've gone to church. Oh, yeah, I've read the Bible. Oh, yeah, I know all the story about Jesus. What happens is our heart gets packed down. And then when God tries to speak a fresh new word and he plants that seed, it can't penetrate because we're familiar with Jesus and because we're indifferent towards the gospel. If right now your heart is indifferent, it's time to seek the Lord. It's time to plow up the fallow ground. What's the second thing? We must, Jesus said, deepen our root system. Seed that fell on rocky ground did not have much soil, but it immediately sprang up and it had no depth. But when the sun came out, it was scorched and it withered away. Church, in this moment of time, we're seeing so many people who did not have depth in their relationship with God. It was shallow, and shallow works when there's no pressure. Shallow works when the heat of persecution and the challenge that requires faith alone, when that heat comes out, if all we have is shallow surface soil and no root system that goes deep, we'll wither up. And we're seeing people's faith wither up. So many people who are like, oh, I'm, not, I'm not even engaging, I'm not growing, I'm not leaning into God, I'm not praying, I'm not doing any of these things because this has been so hard. I get it, I get it. But yet, at the same time, the Lord's saying, deepen your root system. This is a time to deepen your root system, not just to give up, to drive down into that soil, tap into the presence of God. Number three, it's time for us to plow up and get rid of our competing loyalties. Jesus equated this with seed that fell among thorns. The thorns grew up and choked it. What are the things in our lives that are competing? What is there that this world has that can even be compared to knowing Jesus and serving Jesus, but yet we have those things that compete and it chokes the life right out of us? And then lastly, the good soil the soil that's been plowed up, it's been turned over, it's ready to receive. The rocks have been removed. The thorn bushes have been pulled. The weeds aren't there, it's ready. That is the soil that the farmer comes with the seed and the rain. And it produces 30, 60, and 100 fold. Here's the last words that Jesus said in this parable. He who has ears, let him hear. Church, this is not just his prayer, this is my prayer, that we would have ears to hear what Jesus is saying right now, that it's time to seek the Lord. It's time for a divine reset because God just doesn't want the church to survive through this period. He wants us to recalibrate, change our perspective, change our operandi, our modus operandi, the way that we function. 
He wants us to be ready. And I believe what's gonna happen is in the hour in which we live in, pressure is going to come. Pressure is here. And when pressure applies, instead of it suppressing the church, it's gonna scatter the church. And we're gonna go in the power of the Holy Spirit. We're gonna take the gospel into our community. God's gonna get the harvest that he deserves. And we're gonna see the glory of the Lord. Fill the earth like waters cover the sea. That's what I'm believing for. I wanna invite you to stand with me today, wherever you're at. And I want us to pray. I want you to just bow your heads with me in this moment. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, speak to us. Put the plow of heaven into the soil of our heart today and begin to run furrows, rows through the places where we've allowed the world, the sun, the hardship, the disappointments to pack down the soil and steal from us the vitality of your word. Lord, we want the soil of our hearts to be ready. Lord, we need a divine reset. We hear you saying, get ready, get ready. Don't let your heart grow cold. Take heed, watch and pray. This is the hour. The church is gonna be exported. It's gonna be exported by every member walking in their divine identity, filled with the power of heaven and speaking the word of God with boldness. It's not gonna be come and see, it's gonna be go and be. We're about to see God change, bring about a revolution in the people of God and the way that the church operates, but we've gotta be people that are ready. Holy Spirit, prepare us in this moment. We wanna move your heart, God. We wanna partner with what you're doing. If there's anything within us that's not pleasing to you, there's any area of our life, God, where it's just gotten hard. We're not gonna hide it from you. We wanna be fully exposed before you and invite you, God, run the plow through our hearts. Break it up, break up the fallow ground. Turn it over, God, so that we might be ready. <laughs>